All right, good morning, everyone. Um, as people are joining the room, I'm gonna go ahead and start introducing myself and uh, our lecturer for this morning. Um, my name is Val McIntosh. I'm a debate coach at the University of Michigan. Um, and I am extremely excited uh, to introduce you all to our guest lecturer, who is one of the foremost scholars on international relations, Dr. John Mearsheimer. Dr. Mearsheimer is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Prof Service Professor in the Political Science Department at the University of Chicago, where he has taught since 1982. Uh, Dr. Mearsheimer is one of the most preeminent scholars in the Realist School of International Relations Theory, and he has written extensively on security issues and international politics, um, as well as commenting on major policy debates and utilizing social science theory to analyze foreign policy. Um, I know that I personally have read and utilized Dr. Mearsheimer's work extensively in both my debate research and debate teaching for my entire career, um, as well as uh, during my studies in college and international relations. His work is foundational and his analysis of international politics is consistently relevant. Um, with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Mearsheimer to discuss his topic for this morning's lecture, Realism and the Rise of China. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Val. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to a superb group of debaters. Uh, I'm especially intrigued by the idea that I'm talking to debaters like you because I've been told many times over the years that debaters find my work very interesting and they are some of my biggest fans. So that makes me wonder, what's the connection here? Why is it that there is this affinity between me and debaters? And I think the answer is that it's all about theory. And in fact, debating is a theoretical enterprise at its heart. And of course, for someone who does international relations the way I do it, theory is basically God. I think it is of great importance for understanding how the world works. So in, in effect, what I'm saying here is that I think debaters are engaged in a theoretical enterprise in the same way that I am. Now, what exactly do I mean when I say that? I think the world that we live in is incredibly complicated. Uh, there are just so many facts out there. It's just so hard to make sense of what's going on. And the only way you can make sense of the world around you, and the only way you can come up with policies for dealing that world with that world, is to have simple theories in your head about how the world works. Those theories are basically all about reducing this complicated world to a simple set of arguments, a simple set of concepts and a simple set of arguments. And for someone like me who has a realist theory, what I'm doing is coming up with a simple theory that explains how the world works. Now, I think what debaters have to be able to do, just given the nature of the enterprise, is they have to employ simple theories to make their case. And they not only have to be able to make uh, an argument with a simple theory, they also have to understand the arguments against their position. Let's call them the counter arguments. And they also have to understand the counter counter arguments because debaters have to be able to anticipate what the other side is going to argue and then figure out beforehand how they can counter what the other side is going to say. And in a very important way, IR theorists like me are engaged in the same enterprise. I'm constantly aware of what my adversaries, my intellectual adversaries, think about particular issues, how they're gonna come after me, how I'm gonna defend myself, and so forth and so on. So I think what I'm saying here is there is a great deal in common between the theoretical enterprise that I or scholars like me pursue and uh, the enterprise of debating, uh, which you are deeply engaged in. In that spirit, what I would like to do 
is I would like to talk about realism and the rise of China. And the question I want to put on the table is, can China rise peacefully? And then what I want to do is I want to take my simple theory and employ it to explain to you why I think that China cannot rise peacefully. Then I want to introduce two counter arguments and I want to give you my counter counter arguments. Uh, in doing this, I not only want to sort of uh, educate you on realism and how I think about the rise of China, I also just want to show you that in very important ways, my mind works in ways that are similar to how your mind works when you are engaged in debate. So let me go to my PowerPoint, uh, which I think will be helpful for understanding what I'm up to. Okay, I'm assuming that everybody can see uh, the screen. Uh, yes, we can easily. see it perfectly. Thank you very much, Val. Uh, obviously, I wanna talk about realism and the rise of China. And let me start by making just a few introductory comments. When you think about the rise of China, there are really two big questions on the table. Uh, the first is whether China will continue its impressive rise. Uh, that's an enormously important question. And then the other enormously important question is whether China can rise peacefully if it continues its impressive rise. Now, I'm starting with the assumption that China will continue to rise. In other words, I'm not answering the first question. I'm just assuming that China will continue to rise. And I'm obviously focusing on the second question. It's also important to note that when you deal with a question about the future, it is fundamentally theoretical in nature. And the reason is that we have no facts about the future. The future hasn't happened yet. So when you're trying to predict whether or not China can rise peacefully, you simply have to employ a theory to answer that question. And of course, what I'm going to do, and this brings me to the outline of my talk, is I'm going to lay out for you my theory of great power politics. This is what I would call realism 101. Then I'm going to give you a brief history of US foreign policy. And my goal here is to show you that American foreign policy since the founding of this country in 1783, when we got our independence, fits rather neatly with my theory. By describing in rather synoptic form US foreign policy since 1783, I'm trying to give you some confidence that my theory makes sense, that it really applies, that it can explain the real world. So that's the second thing I'll do. Then the third thing I'll do is talk about how I think China will act. And of course, my argument is that China will act according to my theory, and China will imitate the United States. Then I'll talk about how both the United States and China's neighbors are likely to react to China's behavior. Then finally, I'll talk about what I think are the two main challenges to my argument or to my theory. And <coughs> excuse me, I'll give you my counter counter arguments. Uh, I'll tell you how I uh, go about arguing with the two explanations that are designed to give me or to give my theory the most trouble. So that's basically the outline that I'm going to employ in my talk. Now, my theory of great power politics, as some of you know, is based on five simple assumptions about the world. What I do is I lay out those assumptions, then I take those assumptions and I put them in the blender and I hit the on switch and I mix the five assumptions up. And I say that you get three resulting kinds of state behavior. These five assumptions packaged together give you three kinds of behavior. 
And then from that, you can see very clearly, I argue, what the two ultimate goals of great powers are. And the story I'm going to tell you is a rather tragic story. Uh, this is why my book, which lays this theory out, is called The Tragedy of Great Power Politics. It, it's a structural theory which says that the structure of the international relation, uh, excuse me, the structure of the international system creates very powerful incentives for states to compete with each other and even fight wars. Uh, but anyway, let me start with the five assumptions and then I'll put them in the blender and talk about the three resulting kinds of behavior and then talk about the two ultimate goals of great powers. My five assumptions go like this. The first is that states are the key actors in the system, and that system is anarchic. Uh, now, when we say it's anarchic or it's characterized by anarchy, we're not saying that it's characterized by murder and mayhem. Anarchy, as I'm sure most of you know, is just an organizing principle. It means that there's no higher authority that sits above states. States are like pool balls on a table. There's no higher authority on them. Some are smaller and some are bigger, but there is no uh, uh, night watchman. There, there's no higher authority with any power that sits above states. States are the key actors and they operate in anarchy. They do not operate in hierarchy. They operate in anarchy. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that all of those states have some offensive military capability, and some of them, this is the great powers, have a lot of offensive military capability. But even if you're talking about Belgium or you're talking about Guatemala, those countries all have some offensive military capability. The United States, of course, and China, Russia, Israel, France, just to name a few, those countries all have substantial offensive military capability. The third assumption has to do with intentions. Uh, and I would note to you before I explain what I'm talking about with regarding to intentions, that the second assumption deals with capabilities and the third assumption deals with intentions. And whenever you look at other states, you always ask yourself the question, what are their capabilities and what are their intentions? When I was young during the Cold War and we used to look at the Soviet Union, you always wanted to know what were their capabilities, their military capabilities, and what were their intentions? So the second assumption deals with capabilities and the third assumption deals with intentions. And this assumption about intentions is enormously important. And here the basic argument is that states can never know the intentions of other states with a high degree of certainty. You just can't know whether another state has malign intentions towards you or not. And one reason for that is that intentions are in people's heads and you can't see inside people's heads. To go back to the second assumption where we talk about capabilities, Capabilities are things like armored divisions, uh, aircraft carriers, ICBMs, fighter aircraft. These are material capabilities that you can see and you can count. So during the Cold War, we hardly ever had any real difficulty determining what the military capabilities were of the Soviet Union because we could see what they had most of the time. With regard to intentions, we were never sure what Soviet intentions were because we could not look inside the head of Joseph Stalin or inside the head of Nikita Khrushchev and so forth and so on. It's just very hard to tell what their intentions were. And therefore we had huge debates about intentions. Now, some people say, John, you're exaggerating. It's possible to ascertain with a high degree, of, high degree of certainty what intentions are today. I'll concede that for a moment, but I would argue that even if you know what intentions 
of the other side are today, you cannot know future intentions simply because you don't even know who will be in charge of any particular country in one year, five years, 10 years. Just take China. You can't tell me what China's intentions will be in the year 2025 because you don't even know who will be in charge in China. And the same thing is true of China when it looks at the United States. It can't tell who will be in charge in 2025 in Washington and what his or her intentions will be. So the point is, even if you think that you can know a country's intentions now, and I don't believe that, but even if I concede that, the fact is there's no way you can know future intentions. So there is uncertainty about intentions. Uncertainty about intentions is a constant feature of international politics. The fourth assumption is that survival is the principal goal of states. This makes perfect sense because if you don't survive, you can't pursue any other goals. Understand now, I'm not saying that states don't have other goals like prosperity. They do. States have many goals. But survival always has to be the number one goal. And other goals have to be subordinated to survival. Because again, if you don't survive, you can't pursue any of those goals. And then the final assumption is that states are rational actors. They act strategically in pursuit of their goals. In other words, given that their principal goal is survival, that's the fourth assumption, my argument is that states will act rationally to come up with strategies, clever strategies, to maximize their chances of survival. Those are the five assumptions. And you will note that none of those assumptions say that states should be aggressive. That's not the argument when you talk about the assumptions. Those are five, I would say, rather benign assumptions. But you take them and you mix them in the blender and you get a rather nasty and brutish world. Three resulting behaviors. First of all, states fear each other although the level of fear varies from case to case. Now the question is, why do states fear each other? Let's go back to the previous slide. They fear each other. Let's focus on the second and third assumptions. They fear each other because a rival state may have significant offensive military capability and it may have malign intentions. So that causes states to really worry. The second reason that states fear each other is that the system is anarchic. It's not hierarchic. If you get into trouble in international politics and you dial 911, there's nobody at the other end because there's no higher authority, right? So the great danger in the system is that you'll end up living next door to another country that is very powerful, has malign intentions towards you, and you can't dial 911 to get help. That produces fear. States fear each other. The second resulting behavior is that states quickly understand that they operate in a self-help world. As my mother used to say when I was a little boy, God helps those who help themselves. That basic rule of thumb applies in international politics. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the system is anarchic. There is no higher authority that you can turn to. You have to take care of yourself. You might say, what about other states? Well, other states are sometimes useful as allies, but again, you can never be certain what the intentions are of other states, including allies, over the long term. So it quickly becomes apparent to states that it's a self-help world. Now we come to the third resulting behavior, which is of great importance. And that is my argument that in a world where states fear each other and they understand it's a self-help world, what they do is they attempt to maximize the amount of world power that they control. You wanna maximize the amount of power you have because the more powerful you are, 
the less likely it is that any other state will cause you trouble, will do you harm, simply because you are so powerful. So what I'm saying is in an anarchic world where states sometimes have significant offensive military capability and where you cannot be certain of the intentions of those states, the best way to survive is to be really powerful. Think about the United States of America. How many Americans do you think go to bed at night worried about Canada or Mexico attacking the United States? The answer is none. And the reason is we are so powerful relative to all our neighbors that none of our neighbors would ever countenance attacking the United States. It doesn't get any better than that. Would you prefer a situation where the United States had China on one border and Russia on the other border and Germany to the east and France to the west? Of course not. It's much better to have a situation where you have Canada to the north, Mexico to the south, and fish to the east and fish to the west. You want to maximize the amount of power that you control. Now, I argue that ultimately this leads great powers to pursue two particular goals. Just to go back to the previous slide, when I say states attempt to maximize the amount of world power they control, what exactly does that mean? John's argument is great powers have two goals. One is they want to become a regional hegemon. Underline that word regional. I'm arguing that the globe is too big and there's too much water for any country to become a global hegemon. So my argument is the best you can do is become a regional hegemon. And then you want to make sure that no other country dominates its region of the world. In other words, you want to prevent the rise of a peer competitor. And to get way ahead of myself, my argument is that the United States is the only regional hegemon in world history. We, the United States of America, became a regional hegemon. And we have gone to great lengths to prevent peer competitors. And China, as I will argue, is a potential peer competitor. And my argument, of course, is that the United States will try to prevent China from becoming a regional hegemon. And of course, you understand my argument is that China should want to become a regional hegemon. If I were in Beijing, I would want to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. It makes perfect sense from Beijing's point of view. But from America's point of view, it makes perfect sense to prevent China from dominating Asia and becoming a real peer competitor. So that's the basic story I'm now going to tell you. And as I said early on, what I'm going to do is take this theory and use it to explain American history, American foreign policy, in synoptic form, of course, just to give you some sense that my theory uh, has explanatory power when it comes to the real world. The United States, I argue, has pursued regional hegemony from the start, from since 1783. Uh, when the United States got started in 1783, it was a handful of measly colonies strung out along the eastern seaboard. Uh, what happened over the course of the 19th century is that the United States marched across the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, uh, and it conquered uh, huge amounts of territory, and in some cases, like the Louisiana Purchase, it acquired large amounts of territory. And it created this huge piece of real estate called continental America. Uh, we, in the process, murdered huge numbers of Native Americans. We stole their land. Uh, we stole what is the southwest of the United States from Mexico. Uh, if it had not been for the slavery issue, 
all of the countries in the Caribbean would today be part of the United States. It's only slavery that prevented us from going down there. The Northern states did not want any more slave holding states in the Union, and they prevented manifest destiny from moving southward. Uh, and thus manifest destiny only went from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, we invaded Canada in 1812 for the purpose uh, of making Canada part of the United States. The reason that Ottawa is the capital of Canada and not Toronto is because the British government, which ran Canada in the 19th century, expected us to pay a return visit and try to conquer Canada once again. The United States had a huge appetite for continental expansion. And of course, we carved out a huge state in North America. In addition to that, we pursued the Monroe Doctrine. In 1823, President James Monroe basically told the European great powers that the Western Hemisphere belongs to the United States and you are not welcome here. Uh, we're not powerful enough now to throw you out, but we will eventually throw you out. And once you're out, you're not welcome back in. That's what the Monroe Doctrine was all about. It was around 1900, the end of the 19th century, that the United States finally achieved regional hegemony. We were the only great power in the Western Hemisphere. There were no distant great powers in this area, uh, at least no distant great powers that had any military capability. And we were far more powerful than any state uh, in the Western Hemisphere. We had achieved regional hegemony. And as I said before, we are the only country in recorded history that has ever achieved regional hegemony. So I told you before, great powers have two goals. The first goal is to achieve regional hegemony, and the second goal is to make sure that no other state achieves regional hegemony. During the 20th century, this is after the United States achieved regional hegemony on its own, it was faced with four potential peer competitors, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. It is very clear from the historical record, and of course it's consistent with my theory, that the United States does not tolerate peer competitors. Now, let's talk about China. And again, my argument is that China will imitate the United States, and China will act according to my theory. All of this is to say that China will try to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. As I said before, if I were sitting in Beijing, if I were a Chinese policymaker, that would be my principal goal, just as uh, I think it was perfectly appropriate that America established regional hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. There will be two principal goals that will occupy Chinese decision makers' minds. The first is to make sure they are the most powerful state in Asia uh, and to push the United States out of East Asia if it's possible. Now, the reason that China wants to be the most powerful state in Asia is the Chinese full well understand that if you're weak, if there are other states that are more powerful than you, they're likely to prey on you. The Chinese, as I'm sure many of you know, talk incessantly about the century of national humiliation. The century of national humiliation ran from the middle of the 19th century from the middle of the 20th century. The other great powers from Europe, uh, the United States, Japan, all took advantage of China uh, and did terrible things inside China. Uh, the Chinese understand that uh, the reason this happened is that they were weak and they have no intention of ever letting that happen again. The Chinese intend to be very powerful. If you go up to the average person on the street in China and you say you have two choices, you can live in a world where Japan is 10 times more powerful than China, 
or you can live in a world where China is more, 10 times more powerful than Japan. Which world do you prefer to live in? They will tell you axiomatically they want to live in a world where China is 10 times more powerful than Japan. The last thing they want to ever happen is for Japan to be 10 times more powerful than China. They remember what happened the last time Japan was much more powerful than China. So the Chinese, you can rest assured, are going to go to great lengths to make sure that the gap in power between them and all their neighbors is as wide as possible. And I don't blame them one bit. With regard to the United States, they're going to do everything they can to move the United States out of East Asia. They will tell you behind closed doors, Chinese leaders, Chinese elites will tell you behind closed doors that they'd like to push the Americans beyond the first island chain and then beyond the second island chain. They'd like to get them out of East Asia. Again, I don't blame them one bit. We Americans have, an, have a Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine says we do not want distant great powers moving their military forces into the Western Hemisphere. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If we don't want distant great powers in our backyard, why would you think that China would want distant great powers in its backyard? Do you think the Chinese are happy about the fact that the American military is right on their doorstep running naval ships and aircraft up and down their coastline, deploying military forces in countries like South Korea and Japan, which are right near the Chinese mainland? They don't like that at all. They'd much prefer a situation where the United States was pushed out of East Asia. So what the Chinese are going to do, in all likelihood, is they're going to try to establish regional hegemony. And as I say, that'll have two components. One, making sure they're more powerful than all their neighbors. And number two, doing everything they can to get the United States out of East Asia. Furthermore, uh, as China gets more and more powerful, it's likely to interfere in the politics of the Western Hemisphere the way the United States interferes in Asia's politics. You want to understand that one of the reasons, maybe the principal reason, that the United States runs around the world deploying military forces in all areas of the world is because it does not have serious security threats in the Western Hemisphere. We Americans, in a sense, are free to roam. We're free to roam into China's backyard. Well, if China can roam into our backyard, into America's backyard, and form military alliances or close relations with countries like Brazil or Mexico, this will force the United States to focus more on the Western Hemisphere and less on East Asia, which is in China's interest. So you see, the Chinese will not only have an incentive to become a regional hegemon, they will have a powerful incentive to meddle in the Western Hemisphere, maybe even form an alliance or try to form a military alliance with a country in this hemisphere, which of course would violate the Monroe Doctrine and anger the United States greatly. But nevertheless, from China's point of view, that's a smart thing to do. Then the question is, how will the United States and China's neighbors act? In other words, if I'm correct that China is going to try to imitate the United States. China is going to act according to my theory, and it's going to try to dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. What will the United States do, and what will China's neighbors do? Let's start with the United States. The United States will go to great lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia, as my theory predicts. And as the historical record makes clear, as I told you, there were four cases in the 20th century where there were potential peer competitors in the system. And the United States went to great lengths in each of those four cases to prevent that potential peer competitor from becoming a real competitor. And there's no reason to think we won't do the same thing with China. We will go to great lengths. And in 2011, when Hillary Clinton, who was Secretary of State at the time, enunciated the pivot to Asia, 
Basically, she was saying that what the United States is doing is beginning to move to contain China, to contain China the way we contained the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And of course, not only does the historical record back up my claim, I think that it fits neatly with my theory. My theory says that you don't want a peer competitor because a peer competitor is then free to roam into your neighborhood. And from any great power's point of view, that is not a good thing. Uh, so I think what is gonna happen with regard to the United States and China is that China is going to try to dominate Asia. The United States is going to try to prevent China from achieving that goal. And the end result is that you're going to get a serious security competition between the two countries. And there's going to be a real possibility of war. Uh, this situation is going to look in some important ways like the Cold War. The United States and China will be locked in a serious security competition for as far as the eye can see if China continues to grow economically in impressive ways. Now, what about China's neighbors? Countries like India, countries like Japan, countries like South Korea, Vietnam, the Philippines. My argument is that almost all of China's neighbors are likely to ally with the United States to form a balancing coalition against China. Uh, I think there will be some exceptions uh, I think North Korea for sure, and almost certainly Pakistan uh, will ally with China uh, and not ally with the United States. I think India, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, uh, Singapore, Vietnam, all of these countries will ally with the United States. They will be part of the balancing coalition that's aimed at, at containing China. And of course, there's already much evidence that such a balancing coalition is forming. You hear talk, for example, about the Quad. The Quad is basically uh, an institution that's been created to bring the Australians, the Japanese, the Indians, and the Americans closer together uh, for the purposes of military exercises and military coordination, all aimed at coordinating China, all aimed at containing China. My argument is you'll just see more of this uh, with the passage of time. Uh, and again, all of this will lead to an intense security competition in Asia, not just between the United States and China, but between China on one hand and its allies and the United States and its allies on the other hand. And you could even have proxy wars in the region. For example, you could have a conflict between North Korea and South Korea, where North Korea is obviously aligned with China and South Korea is aligned with the United States. So there's all sorts of potential for trouble here uh, in East Asia. And of course, this is what my theory predicts. Now, one important caveat before I go to the counter arguments. Very important to understand that no theory gets it right all the time. As I said in the very beginning of my talk, the world is very complicated and theories are simplifications of reality. That means that when you create a theory, you leave certain factors on the cutting room floor. A good realist like me pays hardly any attention to domestic politics. For me, domestic politics gets left on the cutting room floor. But as you all know, sometimes domestic politics matters. And in those cases where domestic politics matters, my theory is not going to work very well in explaining the case at hand. I like to say, and this is just my gut instinct, that the best theories get it right 75% of the time. Well, let's assume that my theory is one of the best theories. If that's true, that means my theory is wrong 25% of the time. This is not a condemnation of theory. Theory is absolutely essential. It's just to say that you all have to understand the limits of theory. And those limits are built around the fact that theory is a simplification of a complicated reality. And factors are left out of theories that sometimes matter. 
So there is a chance that the analysis that I just gave you will be proved wrong. And indeed, we should hope that my analysis is proved wrong because the story that I'm telling you is a tragic story. And it would be much better if the story I am telling does not come true. But the truth is, I do believe there's lots of evidence that it is coming true and that the situation will get only worse over time. But again, be aware of the limits of theory. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to briefly um, give you the counter arguments against my theory and then lay out my counter counter arguments. And I'm going to give you two sets of counter arguments. The first is economic interdependence, will mitigate security competition and prevent war. Uh, the talk that I've just given to you, I've probably given 120, maybe 125 times. And I've given this talk many times in China. And the counter argument that is invariably used against me is that you will not have a serious security competition, as I claim, and you certainly will not have war, in large part because of economic interdependence. Um, the argument here is that China and its neighbors and China and the United States are intertwined economically in ways that have allowed both sides to get very rich, to become prosperous. And it would be remarkably foolish for any country, whether it's China, the United States, Japan, Vietnam, to start a war because you would be killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. This is an argument that very importantly says that prosperity trumps security, that what countries really care about is their prosperity. And all of this economic interdependence means that prosperity is dependent on peace. And given that prosperity is dependent on peace and prosperity is so important, you will not have conflict. Now, before I tell you how I argue against that, I want to just point out to you that this is one of the three main liberal arguments against realists like me. The other two real, excuse me, the other two liberal arguments are democratic peace theory and uh, liberal institutionalism. Now, I think of the three liberal theories, democratic peace theory is the most powerful. If you ask me which of the liberal theories do I have the most trouble arguing against, it's democratic peace theory, not economic interdependence. Now, the question then is, why don't my interlocutors go to democratic peace theory to argue against me? Why do they go to economic interdependence? The answer is quite simple. China is not a liberal democracy. And there's no evidence that China is going to become a liberal democracy. Indeed, if anything, it looks like China is heading in the other direction and becoming more authoritarian over time. What that means is that democratic peace theory simply doesn't apply. Liberal institutionalism is an interesting theory. It has some explanatory power, but not a whole heck of a lot. The best alternative to democratic peace theory from a liberal perspective is economic interdependence theory. And of course, there you do have, or you certainly have had a lot of economic interdependence uh, between China and its neighbors and between China and the United States. So it's unsurprising that this is the argument that I run into all the time when I give my talk. Now, I, as you would expect, have a series of counter arguments uh, against this counter argument. This is John's counter counter argument. And I'm trying to behave like a good debater here, right? And uh, my argument is that first of all, prosperity matters, but prosperity is always subordinated to security. Uh, and when I say it's subordinated to security, survival is always the principal goal of states. And if survival means that you have to give up some prosperity or a substantial amount of prosperity, you'll do that. Because again, 
there can be no higher goal than survival. Uh, security always trumps prosperity. And in a very important way, what I'm saying, if we elevate up to 60,000 feet, is that politics trumps economics. And just to give you an example of that, uh, the Chinese have made it very clear that if Taiwan were to declare its independence, that China would immediately go to war against Taiwan. And if you say to the Chinese that this would do great damage to your economy and it would lessen your prosperity, the Chinese will tell you that they understand that. They understand full well that if they were to invade uh, Taiwan, that this would have negative economic consequences and hurt prosperity. But the point is that for political reasons, and here we're talking mainly about nationalism, Taiwan is so important, it's sacred territory. It's not possible in Chinese eyes for Taiwan to become an independent sovereign state. And therefore, the Chinese are willing to sacrifice prosperity for political reasons. So it's just important to understand that my first counter argument here is that politics or survival trumps economics or prosperity. Second argument I make is that if you look at World War I, you see a situation where there was a great deal of economic interdependence among all of the European countries. Uh, what you had in Europe before August of 1914 was a world in which there was significant economic interdependence and at the same time, significant security competition. And the point is that despite all of that economic interdependence, you still have World War I. And that case just reminds us that you cannot place too much, uh, too much emphasis on economic interdependence as a way out of the security dilemmas that I've been describing. Final point in my list of counter counter arguments with regard to economic interdependence. If you look at what's happening in the world now with all this decoupling, uh, with all this separation that's developing between the Chinese economy and the US economy, it seems quite clear that there's not going to be as much economic interdependence in the future as there is now. And in very important ways, this argument will lose a lot of its explanatory power simply because both sides in this uh, growing competition will be less economically interdependent in the future than they are now. So I actually think the economic interdependence argument is not that powerful an argument. I think the most powerful argument against me which surprisingly is hardly ever used, is the nuclear weapons argument. I think the argument to use against me most effectively is to say, listen, John, we live in a world of nuclear weapons. The United States and China, and a number of China's neighbors, by the way, have nuclear weapons. And if a war breaks out, nuclear weapons may very well be used, and there's a tremendous danger of escalation and we could all get incinerated. And you wanna understand, John, that that likelihood of escalation does not have to be very high uh, to, for, for nuclear weapons to, to be a significant deterrent to war and even security competition. Because even if there's only a 5% or 1% chance of escalation to the nuclear level. That alone is enough to scare policymakers on both sides half to death, and they won't therefore dare start a war. So given that we live in a nuclear world and that both sides have nuclear weapons, uh, the security competition is simply not gonna be very intense. Uh, and, and the likelihood of war is almost zero. Uh, so this is why your analysis, while it's interesting, John, ultimately does not carry the day. I, of course, have counter arguments to that position. Uh, my first argument would be during the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union both had nuclear weapons and you had 
an intense security competition throughout the Cold War. Uh, the United States went in, a, and the Soviet Union went after each other, uh, hammer and tongue, from 1947 uh, until 1989. Yes, they did not fight a hot war, uh, but they had an intense security competition. And if you read carefully the records of what happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's quite cl clear that uh, we almost ended up fighting a nuclear war. Uh, so don't tell me. Uh, that nuclear war is impossible. Uh, I do think, however, this is me talking now, that nuclear weapons have one very positive effect, and that is that they make World War III impossible. All that is to say, it's virtually impossible for the United States and China to fight a major conventional war, like World War I or World War II, that leads to decisive defeat by one of the actors. That, that's not gonna happen. In a nuclear world, it's almost impossible for the reigning great powers to fight a war where one side wins a decisive victory. So that, I think, is one benefit of nuclear weapons. But the problem is, it is possible to have a limited conventional war. And indeed, one can imagine scenarios where a limited conventional war even turns into a nuclear war. Now, what exactly am I saying here? During the Cold War, the principal area, the principal arena of contention between the Soviets on one side and the Americans on the other, on the other side was Central Europe. And in Central Europe, we had massive armies. They were armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons. And in that world, it was almost impossible to get a war going, a conventional war going between the United States and the Soviet Union, because it would have been a clash of massive proportions where both sides had nuclear weapons. And there was at least a reasonable chance that nuclear weapons would be used. So when the United States would run war games during the Cold War, it found it very difficult to actually get a war started because who would wanna start a war in the heart of Europe given the constellation of forces and the presence of nuclear weapons in large numbers in particular. The situation in East Asia is fundamentally different. There's no equivalent of the Central Front. And when we think about a war between the United States and China, we imagine a limited war over the South China Sea, or a limited war over Taiwan, or a limited war in the East China Sea, where the United States backs up the Japanese over these contested islands that sit in the middle of the East China Sea. So what I'm saying here to you is that we're talking about much smaller scale wars and we're talking about wars that are off the Chinese mainland. And it is plausible that to argue that China and the United States will actually end up in a shooting match in one of those three scenarios. And if you have a situation where let's just say the United States is really uh, clobbering Chinese military forces, the Chinese might very well be tempted to use a nuclear weapon or two to rectify the situation. And by the way, you could imagine a situation where if the Chinese military was beating up on the American military, the Americans might be tempted to use a nuclear weapon or two to rescue the situation. Because again, you would be using nuclear weapons in the water off the coast. And it's more plausible to think about using nuclear weapons in that scenario than was the case during the Cold War when you were talking about a war in the heart of Europe involving massive armies with thousands of nuclear weapons. So my counter counter argument is that yes, nuclear weapons take World War III off the table. That's true. But the presence of nuclear weapons does not rule out the possibility 
of a limited war and the possibility of limited use with nuclear weapons. And therefore, I argue that the situation with regard to a Cold War between China and the United States is likely to be more dangerous than the Cold War was between 1947 and 1989. Uh, so I think as we move forward uh, that we are in big trouble. And of course, my argument, my bottom line is that my realist theory predicts that big trouble between China and the United States is going to take place were going to happen if China continues its impressive rise, uh, according to my theory, uh, which as I said to you before, is not airtight. Uh, but I think that it will be proved correct, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that neither economic interdependence nor nuclear weapons are likely to alter that grim story. Although I do think that uh, that the best counter to my position is not the economic interdependence argument. It is the nuclear weapons argument, which is that in a nuclear world, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, China and the United States or China and its neighbors engaging in a serious conflict. Uh, on that note, I will stop talking and uh, I will anxiously await your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that amazing, fascinating discussion. Um, we have a ton of questions and I have basically gone through and tried to organize them thematically so we can kind of uh, mirror a little bit the, the organization of your uh, lecture. So I'm gonna start with some theory questions. Um, and then kind of move into questions about the changing nature of power and how that affects uh, the implications of your theories going forward. And then some questions about US foreign policy and the rise of China specifically. Um, so I'll start out with um, one question, which is, which was, uh, could you expand a little bit upon uh, what constitutes regional hegemony um, and were, uh, some historical examples of empires that are um, described as hegemons like the Roman Empire or the British Empire, would you consider those regional hegemons? Yeah, a regional hegemon uh, is a somewhat tricky um, concept to define because it's hard to neatly divide the world up into regions. But I actually think you can do a pretty good job. I think that Europe is a self-contained region. I think you can talk about the Middle East or especially the Persian Gulf as a region. You can talk about the Western Hemisphere. You could talk about East Asia, right? Or you could talk about Asia more generally. And if you talked about Asia more generally, that would include Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, and Central Asia, those four corners of Asia. So if you're talking about being a regional hegemon in all of Asia, I think it's pretty easy to define that. Uh, I would also note that some people talk about Eurasia being a hegemon in Eurasia. Uh, you want to remember that during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was our principal competitor. And the Soviet Union is physically located in Europe and in Asia. And therefore, we used to worry about the Soviets dominating Eurasia. So Eurasia was talked about as an entire region, which was really Europe plus East Asia. That was Eurasia. So it was two regions combined to give you Eurasia. So there's no simple way of dividing up the world uh, neatly. Uh, but I think that it is relatively easy to do. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, we talk about Europe, we talk about East Asia, and we talk about the Persian Gulf. Those are the regions uh, outside of the Western Hemisphere. And the Western Hemisphere is the one region where you've had a regional hegemon, and that's the United States. Uh, the question is whether or not 
uh, uh, the Roman Empire was a regional hegemon or not. Uh, I've never looked carefully at that, but I think that as powerful as the Roman Empire was, there were other actors in the system at the time. There were large barbar barbarian tribes that uh, challenged the Romans. And I don't view the Roman Empire as a regional hegemon, uh, but I understand that one could differ on that point. So um, I'm actually gonna follow up on one thing you mentioned in that uh, for another question that we had, which was, do you think that the United States is a regional hegemon or a global hegemon? I think that the United States is a regional hegemon. Uh, I, I think that the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and I think the great danger that we now face is that uh, China will become a regional hegemon in, uh, in, in Asia. Uh, I think there are now three great powers in the system. Uh, and those three great powers are Russia, China, and the United States. And the great danger is that China will become a hegemon in East Asia. So I'll ask you a follow-up question to that um, that we had, which is, why do states uh, seek to prevent the rise of regional hegemon in another region? So, you know, if the if a one country dominates one region and another country dominates another region, can those state, those regional hegemons coexist with one another? Yes, uh, it's a great question. The reason the United States goes to great lengths to prevent the rise of peer competitors, another regional hegemon, is that if another country becomes a regional hegemon, it is free to roam and it is free to roam into your backyard. As I said during my talk, the United States, because it's a regional hegemon, roams all over the world. The United States has military forces all over the planet. And the reason that the United States has military forces all over the planet is because it doesn't have to worry about security in its own hemisphere, in its own region. If China doesn't have to worry about security in its own region, if China is so powerful that it's free to roam, it can roam into the Western hemisphere. And no great power wants another great power roaming into its hemisphere. So that's the principal reason that we care about whether or not Imperial Germany dominates Europe or the Soviet Union dominates Eurasia or China dominates Asia, right? Because we don't want any other country to be so powerful that it can challenge us in our own region. So let me ask you another question related to that, which is, um, what do you think a Chinese incursion into the US, into the Western Hemisphere would look like? Um, and how would they attempt to, you know, how do we think they might attempt to undermine US power in, within our own region um, in the way that we have undermined Chinese power in their region? Well, a good example would be they could form a military alliance with Canada and Mexico, uh, and then the Canadians and, and the Mexicans could invite them to station military forces in Canada and in Mexico. Now, most people think this is far-fetched, uh, and it is far-fetched because the United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere, and China is in no position uh, to do that in the Western Hemisphere. But if you project forward a balance of power that's fundamentally different than the one that exists today. And China is far more powerful uh, in 30 or 40 years than it is today. And it is a regional hegemon, then it's free to roam. And if countries in the Western hemisphere have problems with the United States, uh, they may feel that it makes sense to invite um, the Chinese in to help protect them. You want to remember that the United States is in Japan. It is in South Korea. We are physically located in a variety of countries right on China's doorsteps. Why couldn't that happen uh, in reverse 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road? Why couldn't the Chinese end up in our backyard? Uh, 
I'm old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? What the Soviets did was they formed a military alliance with Cuba and they put uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba. And later they talked about building a naval base at Cienfuegos. And the United States told them in no uncertain terms that both of these steps were just unacceptable, right? But all of that just goes to show you that the Soviet Union was interested in deploying military force in the Western Hemisphere. This is hardly surprising. So a really powerful China that's free to roam would have powerful incentives, in my opinion, to establish military alliances in the Western Hemisphere. And there are plenty of countries in the Western Hemisphere that really don't like the United States. Most Americans find this very hard to believe. But there are many countries in this hemisphere that don't like us. And many of them fear us. If you're Venezuela today or you're Cuba today, uh, you think long and hard about forming a military alliance with a really powerful China that was free to roam. Uh, so we want to make sure that China is not free to roam. So uh, this actually brings me to another set of questions that I think uh, may be relevant here, which is to talk about kind of the nature of alliances in um, the international system and how uh, your theories account for the nature of military alliances. So um, if you could talk maybe a little bit about how alliances serve or don't serve as kind of a, you know, a, a pseudo 911 in international relations um, that, you know, we kind of talked about that, that that doesn't fully exist, but can those kind of step in and, and act as, um, you know, the, the pseudo 911 in international crises? Well, I think alliances are enormously helpful for countries uh, that are engaged in security competition. Uh, I think if, if you had to do the Cold War all over again, you would definitely do it with NATO. NATO was a wildly successful alliance. And the United States had successful alliances in East Asia as well. It had an alliance with Japan, had an alliance with South Korea. Uh, so alliances really matter. And the Soviets had an alliance structure in Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact. So, uh, so allies matter, but it's important to understand that that's not the same as having a 911. A 911 is we have an ultimate authority or a higher authority that you can turn to in the crunch uh, to rescue you or save you. Uh, and uh, there just is no higher authority. Sometimes people will say, well, what about the United Nations? And I think the United Nations serves a few useful purposes, but the idea that the United Nations could ever rescue a country that's in deep trouble is a laughable argument. I mean, it's just, just not going to happen. There, there is no higher authority. Uh, what you would need, Val, is a world state, right? In other words, states would have to come together and form a world state. Uh, and that world state would be the 911. But of course, no state on the planet wants to form a world state. And certainly the United States doesn't want to do that. The Chinese don't want to do that. And the Russians don't want to do that. They, <coughs> excuse me, they want to remain sovereign states. And <coughs> excuse me again, as long as that's the case, right, you're in an anarchic system. And then the best you can do is to turn to alliances. And as I say, alliance, alliances can be very useful. And going forward for the Americans, as they deal with the Chinese over time, uh, they're going to depend heavily on allies. And I think the Chinese will try to put together an alliance structure of their own, again, with countries like North Korea, Cambodia, Laos, Pakistan, and so forth and so on. So how would you respond to people who argue that the response rather than saying, you know, when, when the, the possibility that the U.S. could become entangled in one of these, con or embroiled in one of these conflicts with China, what would, how would you respond to people who argue that restraint is perhaps a better response in those instances? Well, I think restraint uh, is a concept that has a great deal of merit for American foreign policy, 
when it comes to intervening in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya. I think if you go back to the unipolar moment when the United States pursued a foreign policy that I would call liberal hegemony, this is before the rise of China, before China became a great power. Uh, the United States engaged in all of these remarkably foolish wars. Uh, and during those years, it made eminently good sense to pursue a foreign policy of restraint instead of liberal hegemony. And moving forward, we should avoid wars in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Even though the unipolar moment's over, liberal hegemony is history, and the United States is now focusing on China, we should still avoid fighting wars in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. We should show restraint vis-a-vis -vis those smaller countries where we tend to get bogged, that, bogged down in endless wars. But with regard to containing China, it's hard to talk about restraint. The fact is that the United States is going to have to go to great lengths to put together a balancing coalition and do all that it can to contain China. Uh, so I think that restraint is going to have limits as a foreign policy uh, as long as China continues to rise. You understand, of course, that my argument leads to the conclusion that we should hope China does not rise. I hope the Chinese economy runs into significant economic problems in the future and China does not continue to rise. Then all the analysis that I just gave you over the past hour goes out the window because there is no potential hegemon. And I hope that is the case. I'm curious how you think that, what you think about how that applies to like waning powers like Russia, which is losing clout, but trying to you know, scramble in different ways to maintain power, um, and whether you think we should be still prioritizing a policy of containment against Russia, or if we should be moving toward restraint as it relates to Russia. I think the Russian case is very interesting. As I said to you before, there are three great powers in the system now. You know, we've moved from unipolarity to multipolarity, and the three great powers are the United States, China, and Russia. And it's quite clear from my analysis and from everything you read in the newspaper that what really matters moving forward is the US-China competition. And this is because Russia is just not that powerful. It is a great power. It's not that powerful. And it's a declining great power. So the United States does not have to think about Russia as a potential peer competitor. It has to think about China as a potential peer competitor, but not Russia. So the question then is, how should the United States think about, China, about Russia? And my view is that the United States should go to great lengths to have good relations with Russia and get Russia to be on its side against China. What's actually happened, because the United States has pursued such a foolish foreign policy since 1989, what's happened is we have driven the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. We have made the Russians into enemies, and the Russians are now allied with the Chinese. What the United States should do is the United States should go to great lengths to flip Russia. It should go to great lengths to get Russia on America's side and not on China's side. The United States is going to need all the help it can get to contain China. And it would be very good if it got help from Russia and didn't have Russia on the other side of the equation. But up to now, we've done a terrible job in that regard. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a few more theory questions. Um, and then we'll kind of move on to the next uh, thematic grouping of questions. Um, so the first is, how do you feel that non-state actors such as global multinational corporations um, or terrorist groups, some of which have the ability to use force via private military corporations or um, sort of their own small militaries um, factor into uh, your theories and how we should think about them in international politics? 
Well, as, as far as how they factor into my theory, they don't factor in at all. My theory, and this goes back to my first assumption, my theory focuses on states. And the argument that I make is that states are the principal actors in the system. And then the subsequent theory is built all around states, period, end of story. Now, what about these non-state actors? Do I think they're consequential? No. I think they attract a lot of attention in the media, but in the final analysis, they don't matter very much at all. If you want to understand international politics, uh, what you want to focus on are states. Okay. Um, another question was, uh, do you think, so this, this goes to the question of whether or not states can ever really know anything about one another's intentions. And the question asked was, uh, do you think intelligence or espionage uh, can affect the relative certainty with which one may be able to make uh, predictions about how another state may act? I think that good intelligence, we really sort of get inside an adversary's political system. You have good intelligence sources, helps you better think about the other side's intentions. So I, I agree with the questioner in that regard. But the $64,000 question is whether you can ever achieve a very high degree of confidence in your assessment of the other side's intentions. And my argument is you cannot. Even if you penetrate the other side's decision-making process, it is just very difficult to know what the intentions are of another state. And as I said in my presentation, even if I'm wrong, and the thrust of the question is correct, you still have to deal with the problem of future intentions. Even if you know what the intentions of a state are today, you can't know what those intentions will be in two or three or four years. Remember, on January 29th, 1933, you had Weimar Germany. On January 30th, 1933, you had Nazi Germany. You went from Weimar Germany, which was a liberal democracy, to Nazi Germany, which I don't have to describe. Regimes change, leaders change. It's hard to know who will be in power in any country and what his or her intentions will be. So even if I concede to the questioner that you can get inside the decision-making process of a particular state and figure out what's going on, it's still impossible to know future intentions. Um, okay, so the next question is about sort of the changing nature of power and how that affects the international system. So um, do you, what do you think is going to change about how countries establish hegemony as technology uh, changes and adapts, including things like artificial intelligence, the ability to use hybrid warfare um, against other countries in addition to their, uh, your individual military uh, forces? Um, and how do you think that will change how states pursue hegemony in the international order? Well, I think that um, the basic story I tell uh, remains intact in the future. And, and I think the basic story I tell can explain most of recorded history. I mean, we can go back to the Spartans and the Athenians. We can go back um, to medieval Europe. We can go back to the dynastic state system that's created roughly uh, after 1648. And I think the theory is quite powerful. But there's no question that what changes all the time is the military technology that's available to states to wage security competition and wage war with each other. Uh, just to give you one obvious example, which I talked about in my presentation, nuclear weapons. Before 1945, there were no nuclear weapons. And if you want to talk about uh, 
a technology that's something of a game changer. It's the coming of nuclear weapons. As I said in my presentation, nuclear weapons basically take large-scale conventional war off the table. You're not going to have a World War III that looks like World War I or World War II, uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion of almost all the experts I know. Uh, so there's no question that all these new technologies are uh, on the horizon or emerging today, like AI, hypersonic weapons, cyber war, and so forth and so on. And there's no question that they're going to have something of an influence on how the security competition is waged and how a possible war is waged. But they're not going to change the basic essence of international politics. There's only one technology that had the possibility of doing that, and that was nu that's nuclear weapons, right? And, and that's why we talk about the nuclear revolution. There are certain people who believe that nuclear weapons fundamentally altered international politics. I don't believe that, but there are people who do believe that, respectable scholars for sure. But aside from nuclear weapons, there is no technology on the horizon uh, that I see that comes close to nuclear weapons uh, in terms of just changing how security competition is waged. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to uh, some questions about U.S. foreign policy. Um, so the first question was, um, when uh, in the founding of the United States, um, you know, it seemed like a lot of, in, if you read back some of those those documents from the founding fathers, they seem to want the U.S. to engage in more of a policy of restraint. Um, and then we kind of, you know, transitioned into becoming a regional hegemon relatively quickly. Um, do you think this uh, was a facade in that, like, we always were intended or to become a regional hegemon? Um, uh, or do you think that in, that state intentions just ne generally go against the goal of, of that kind of um, restraint? I think there's no question that over the course of American history, there were policymakers who did not want to expand uh, at different points in time. Uh, if my memory's correct, Abraham Lincoln, for example, was against the Mexican War, and he was not in favor of uh, annexing the Southwest of the United States. Uh, and he was not the only person in that regard. But my argument is that the structure of the system pushes states to expand. And those who want to, uh, to, to hold back uh, the ambition to gain more territory, want to hold back uh, uh, the pursuit of regional hegemony, are going to lose almost every time. This is not to say that states are going to behave in wild and crazy ways and start wars that end up uh, in their destruction. That may happen, but states rationally calculate whether or not they think they can achieve regional hegemony because regional hegemony is such an attractive outcome. It, most Americans take this for granted, but the idea that you dominate the Western Hemisphere it's really a wonderful thing. And this is why uh, the United States actually went to great lengths over the course of the late 18th and 19th century to become a regional hegemon. And it's that structural imperative in my story that swamps all of those restrainers. Um, so the last question I'll ask about US foreign policy before we move on to talking specifically about the rise of China um, was, can you briefly describe your thoughts on the foreign policy platforms of the major presidential candidates and, and how those interact with what you think the U.S. should be doing um, as it relates to foreign policy? Well, it's not terribly easy to tell at this point in time. Uh, the Biden administration has not said a whole heck of a lot uh, about foreign policy and not articulated a clear uh, alternative uh, to what President Trump is doing. Uh, and President Trump's foreign policy is not exactly easy to understand. Uh, his comments seem to be somewhat contradictory. And although he 
occasionally gives clear evidence that he's going to do X, two weeks later, he does Y instead. So I'm not 100% certain what's going on here. But let's talk about it in terms of uh, dealing with China and uh, dealing with other areas of the world uh, where we're fighting the forever wars. I think that President Trump's basic instinct uh, has been to confront China, to contain China. I think the Trump administration is filled with people who think that China is a potential peer competitor and it has to be contained. At the same time, President Trump himself is interested in ending the forever wars. He's made that very clear. But he's had very little success doing that because the foreign policy establishment has thwarted him. He tried to get us out of Syria. He failed. He's tried to get us out of Afghanistan. He's failed. Uh, and we now have more troops in the Middle East than we had when he took office, right? So despite all his emphasis on ending the forever wars, he's not been very successful. Uh, so I think that's President Trump. If there's a President Biden, I think the evidence is quite clear that he's going to contain China, uh, that he's going to follow largely in the footsteps of uh, President Trump. I think a President Biden uh, would uh, pay more careful attention to the wishes of our allies than President Trump does. President Trump is not very good at dealing with our allies. He tends to want to slap them around. Uh, I think Biden would treat our allies with much greater respect, which I think would ultimately be a good thing. But I think Biden, just like Trump, uh, will be deeply concerned about containing China. With regard to the forever wars, I think uh, that the Biden administration will be filled with people who will be reluctant to end the forever wars. Uh, many of the people that come into office with, uh, uh, with President Biden, assuming he gets elected, will be the same people who got us into the forever wars. Uh, so uh, I don't see too much difference in terms of our foreign policy if uh, President Trump is reelected or if we have a new president who obviously would be President Biden at this point in time. Okay, uh, with the last few minutes we have, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions specifically about the rise of China. Um, the first one um, deals with the uh, impact of the COVID crisis on uh, the competi the peer competition between the United States and China. Um, and specifically, this person asked, um, in a recent survey of IR experts, foreign affairs found that a majority of scholars disagreed with the statement that the pandemic will empower China at the expense of the United States. Do you think this is accurate? Do you think that what, basically what impact do you think the, the pandemic crisis will have on, on the relationship between the United States and China and their competition? I think the pandemic will have very little effect. Uh, I think what's driving this train is the balance of power. Uh, it's the fact that China is growing economically uh, by leaps and bounds. Now, if the pandemic creates a situation where the Chinese economy flatlines, let's just say the Chinese economy stops growing because of the pandemic, but the American economy does not stop growing uh, and we return to unipolarity, then the pandemic really mattered. But I don't see that happening. Uh, I think relations between the United States and China would be terrible today, absent the pandemic. And in fact, if you look at US-China relations in early January, especially economic relations, especially trade relations. In early January, before the pandemic became a big issue, uh, you can see that relations between the two countries were deteriorating. And the reason they're deteriorating is that China's moving into a position where it's uh, clearly a potential peer competitor. And the United States has put its gun sights on China, as you would expect. And this has led to this growing security competition. Uh, and this is all independent of COVID. So I don't think COVID matters that much. 
So similarly to what you described, you know, it seems like if the opposite were to happen, where China's economy were to recover very quickly from the crisis, whereas the U.S. economy did not recover, that that could also potentially um, impact the that competition in favor of China. Now that's a very smart insight. There's no question about that. <laughs> It, it, if the American economy tanked, I mean, we really ran into big trouble and China recovered from its present problems in a nice way and its economy began to boom, uh, it would put them in a position to cause us really big trouble. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, you want to remember that China has four times as many people as the United States, four times as many people. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States had roughly the same number of people. China has four times as many people as us. And the Soviet Union, at its peak, was about one third as wealthy as the United States. So the Soviet Union had roughly the same number of people as the United States, and it was roughly one third as wealthy at its peak. We're talking about a country that has four times as many people and then to add your story to the picture, right? Uh, we're talking about a China that continues to grow and grow economically, maybe turn into a giant South Korea or a giant Taiwan, while the American economy looks like it did during the Great Depression. That would be a very bad situation for us. We'd really be behind the eight ball. Okay, I'm gonna ask one last question um, and then we will, uh, you know, finish up here. The last question I have is about um, how you think Taiwan plays into the relationship and the competition between the U.S. and China, and specifically, what should Taiwan be doing to uh, sort of protect itself and how it relates to the United States or China um, in order to kind of preserve its own, uh, its, its, uh, Sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty, yes, the sovereignty was the word I was looking for. Uh, to preserve its sovereignty or just to avoid being invaded or attacked? Well, I mean, there's no question that from China's perspective, Taiwan is sacred territory. And I've never met a single Chinese who doesn't fervently believe that Taiwan has to become part of China. Uh, at the same time, if you are Taiwanese and, and you have a Taiwanese identity and you don't want to be part of China, right, you have to figure out what's the best way to prevent being swallowed up by this giant country that is physically very close to you and has its gun sights on you. And it seems to me quite clear that from Taiwan's point of view, their best insurance policy is the United States of America. So they have a vested interest in cozying up to the United States, which is what they've been doing. This brings us to the question of how does the United States think about Taiwan? Uh, I think at this point, we are clearly committed to the defense of Taiwan. And as this security competition heats up, I think what's going to happen is that the United States is going to double down on Taiwan. We're going to go to great lengths to make it clear to the Chinese that they can't take Taiwan and that we'll fight and die to defend Taiwan. Uh, we'll give armaments to Taiwan. We'll give financial aid to Taiwan. This, of course, will enrage the Chinese. But I don't think at this point the United States has a whole heck of a lot of choice. Because if we were to abandon Taiwan at this juncture, it would have huge ramifications for how our other allies in Asia thought about the reliability of the United States. In other words, it's just hard for me to imagine us abandoning Taiwan. And again, if anything, I think what we'll do is we'll double down. The problem that we face, Val, is that with the passage of time, China is likely to grow increasingly powerful in East Asia. And as China grows increasingly powerful, it becomes more and more difficult for us to defend Taiwan. 
because Taiwan is a small island sitting right off the Chinese mainland. The United States is 6,000 miles away in California. We're projecting power over huge distances. And as time goes by, it becomes harder and harder to see how we can defend Taiwan, no matter how interested we are in doing that. So I think we just better hope that China does not continue to grow economically to the point where it becomes Godzilla, because then it's going to be hard for us to defend Taiwan. And if it's hard for us to defend Taiwan, then you start scratching your head and saying, what are the, con what are the consequences of that for defending South Korea or, depending, or defending Japan? Uh, again, this is a country that has four times the population of the United States. This is a huge country in terms of population size and in terms of geography. It's like a giant aircraft carrier. Uh, so for the time being, we're joined at the hip with the Taiwanese, but this is a relationship that could get dicey over time if China does continue to grow. And this gets back to my bottom line point that we as Americans should hope that China does not continue to grow economically, not because we have anything personal against the Chinese, uh, on the contrary, it's only because in an anarchic world where you cannot know the intentions of other states, and some states have really serious military capabilities, the best way to survive is to be a regional hegemon, as we are, and number two, make sure you don't have a potential peer competitor. And that means making sure China doesn't dominate Asia. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mearsheimer, for all of your insights for answering all of our questions. I wish we could talk to you for another hour to answer the rest of the questions, but unfortunately you have other things to do and we have to go uh, get to our afternoon classes. So thank you again so much um, for your time and, and we really, really enjoyed having you. It was my pleasure, Val. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for watching um, and uh, we will see you all in your classes shortly. Have a great day, everyone.